good afternoon, good morning, good evening. Thank you, you all, to attend uh, this uh, talk today. So I will give the floor first to Professor Claudio Diniz from Federal University of Rio Grande do Sul. So Claudio, the floor is with you. But before that, I also would like to thank uh, Bruno Zatti to accept our invitation and also Claudio Diniz to accept it to be the session chair today. So, okay. Claudio. Thank you, Professor Reis. So uh, it's a pleasure for me to introduce Professor Bruno Zatti from Universidade Federal de Pelotas. Uh, so, uh, Professor Brunzatti received his PhD degree in microelectronics from the Federal University of Rio Grande do Sul in Porto Alegre in 2012 uh, uh, with summa cum laude distinction. So, he's a professor now at the Federal University of Pelotas and a member of, group, uh, of the group of architectures and the integrated circuits and the video technology research group. Uh, he has um, over uh, 16 uh, years research experience on algorithms and hardware architectures for visual signal processing, including three years as, as a researcher at the Karlsruhe Institute of Technology in Karlsruhe, Germany, and one year as a visiting prof professor as, uh, at the University of California at Irvine, USA. He has published over uh, 150 papers in international journals and conferences, one book entitled 3D Video Coding for Embedded Device. He is also a senior member of IEEE, member of the ABNTC21, uh, member of the uh, IEEE uh, CAS Visual Signal Processing and Communications Technical Committee, the VCSPCTC, uh, and associate editor for the IEEE Transactions on Circuits and Systems for Video Technology. Uh, and since 2017, Professor Zach holds the status of CNPq Pro Productivity, Productivity Research Fellow. So uh, thank you also very much, Bruno, for accepting our invitation. And the floor is yours for your talk. Thank you, Claudio. It's a, a pleasure for me to, to accept the invitation. Thank you, Professor Hayes, for inviting me to speak uh, at this uh, very interesting series of talks. Uh, also, thank you, Professor José Zambuja, as the, the chapter uh, chairman. And uh, for me, it's a pleasure, Claudio, that uh, you're hosting my, my talk because we are friends and research partners since over over than 15 years. So uh, when we join our grad studies, so it's really a pleasure uh, to have a friend hosting my session. Uh, so. Uh, the idea today is discussing a little bit about immersive media technology, uh, looking uh, at the perspective of CAS society, of course. So uh, the discussion here is trying to bring some uh, introduction to the main topics to understand the technology that we see nowadays and uh, we expect to see in the uh, coming years and uh, discuss possible solutions that we we expect to see in the coming years. Before moving to that, uh, I would like to acknowledge first my university, Federal University of Pelotas, uh, the Center of uh, Technology Development where I work, uh, the graduate program, um, computer uh, computing, and uh, of course, my research group, that's the Video Technology Research Group. Uh, we stay in very South Brazil, a city called Pelotas, and here you see some nice pictures from the city, from the university and the, the channels, the river channels that you see in the city. Uh, and our group, the VTEC, is actually uh, run by five professors, myself, uh, Professor Daniel Palomino, Guilherme Correa, Luciano Agostini and Marcelo Porto that are the leading uh, uh, quite large team. We have uh, 24 PhD students uh, working with us. Uh, 12 master students and 14 undergrad students. Of course, other collaborators as well and partners in universities around Brazil and outside Brazil as well. So please uh, go to our website if you want to fetch more information about us uh, or reach me by my email and we can discuss uh, different topics related to this talk today. So just one picture, of course, this is before pandemic. Uh, this is really outdated. I'm there, so you can, 
you can see that I in that picture as well. And of course, our team has been updated. New members have come and some have gone, but uh, just a sample of this team. When we talk now, now just shifting, shifting gears, when you talk about immersive media, uh, sometimes it's not really clear uh, what we are talking about. So I uh, decided to start this discussion with two really short videos, 30 seconds with each one. I hope you can see it. Uh, that try to demonstrate some of the experience that we want to see when we have really good or immersive sort of media. These uh, both videos you're fine following the links that you see below. The first one is uh, a video from uh, Magic Leap, and the second one is from Microsoft Hololens. So you can see a lot of interaction, you can see a lot of immersion, you can see a lot of objects going and moving around, scaling, lightning. So everything's there. Uh, of course, those videos are much more like concepts. Uh, this is not quite what we have seen these days. Uh, I don't think you guys have those sort of uh, interaction or re uh, real uh, immersion as you can see in those videos. And what we are looking for, uh, just to bring some more um, known terminology people used to refer as virtual reality augmented reality mixed reality uh, so these are the the names that people are used to um, there are some applications some glasses that you can uh, experience uh, some level of this immersion uh, however it's um, there's a lot to be done uh, the experience we are looking it's not still av not available yet so uh when we talk about really uh immersion immersion uh, we, we are looking for experiences that are closer to the reality uh and it means that we need to have a good perception of depth so we, you really need to perceive the, the the depth of the scene where you are and more than that you need to have a uh, freedom of movements. Uh, you don't want just to stare at a flat screen in front of you. You want to move your head uh, and maybe you want to move your body and walk around and uh, experience different points of view and different scenes uh, inside the same scene or different viewpoints of the same scene. So here just uh, I, I call freedom of movement. And actually, we are going to discuss what level of freedom we may have, like 3DOF, or DOF is degree of freedom. We are going to discuss more. Or 6DOF, that's, uh, let's say, a golden standard, something uh, closer to the reality. But before moving to those really exciting sort of immersive uh, content, we need to understand uh, where we come from and where we, we are these days. So the first movement towards immersion, it's really our 2D videos. Uh, okay, maybe it's massive, but if you think about it, when we start like with televisions with very low resolutions, we have one the main of um, immersion that increases uh, with the increase of the resolution. So from VGA, standard definition, uh, to full HD, to 4K, to 8K, we are improving uh, the quality. It becomes more realistic and it becomes a little bit more immersive. Uh, nowadays, we, we see like everywhere HDR, that's high dy dynamic range that improves the perception of uh, colors. Uh, so it's, it's another, another dimension of immersion. And of course, the how fluid your video is. Uh, so when you came from 15 to 30, 60, 120 frames per second, you feel uh, the motion are more fluid. So it, it's more realistic. You are going towards better immersion. Of course, you don't have at this moment, uh, when we talk about 2D videos, you don't have perception of the depthness of your scene. So, uh, to have this perception, um, we need to very briefly understand uh, how we perceive uh, this depth. 
So uh, the first thing to learn is, of course, we have depth perception uh, at some level, even with 2D videos. We have in a painting or, or in a photo, we can see or we can understand the depth of the scene. Uh, because there are some cues that are monocular cues that are related to texture of the scene, to your prior knowledge, you have uh, one idea about the size of the object that you, you, for instance, that you expect to see. You have perspective, uh, you have occlusion. So if you have different objects, one in front of the other, you, you know you have the relation in terms of depth uh, between those objects. And of course you have shading. With all this information, you can build, uh, your brain is able to build some a level of 3D perception. But of course, this is not everything. We want more realistic. So if we move to a more realistic 3D perception, uh, we do have also binocular cues. And uh, basically, it's stereo or binocular parallax. So it's um, the difference of perception uh, between the two eyes. So. Uh, imagine your eyes are as cameras. You have one camera, the right camera, and the left camera, they are displaced. And this displacement or disparity between them, uh, it's an important tool so you can infer the depth, of, uh, the depth of the scene. If you have close objects, the disparity between the eyes is really strong. And if we, you have far objects, the disparity is, is shorter. It's smaller. So you have, based on this binocular cue, you have the idea, the perception of the 3D scene, much better than we have when using just monocular cues. And we start to have, uh, in our multimedia content, we start to have this sort of uh, information when we look to stereo videos. So everyone probably have used one of those 3D televisions and where we, we have glasses, active or passive glasses. People used to hate those glasses. And uh, at, do, at that technology, uh, what is used is really a stereo video. So you have the right and the left view uh, that are two viewpoints that are captured and displayed to you without further processing. Uh, of course, there is compression, transmission, decompression, but uh, the viewpoints are fixed. So uh, your right eye is looking to the, the images that the right camera has captured and your left eye uh, is looking to what your left camera uh, is, has captured. So um, there are some, some limitations, of course. Uh, you can see the 3D you have the 3D impression, you have the depth uh, of the scene, but you have no, have no motion parallax. So if you remove your head, you are definitely not changing the perspective of the scene. Uh, and of course, uh, you have a fixed distance between the cameras that capture the information. So um, of course, this distance is not the same for different people. So maybe uh, it becomes annoying because uh, the, the the video was captured with cameras with six, usually six and a half centimeters away from each other. But maybe your eyes are a little bit more or a little bit less distant, and this becomes annoying. Uh, so those videos are not delivering what we call uh, motion parallax. That's another we could call binocular. I prefer to call time cue because uh, it's it's about time. Uh, when you move along the time, you move your head or you move, walk around the scene, you want to see different perspectives. You have different points of view. So the called motion parallax is uh, when uh, the observer moves around the scene. And this uh, can be at some level uh, delivered uh, by the technology that we call multi-view videos. And actually I spent my whole PhD working uh, on those type of videos. Uh, they are typically captured by a large array of cameras. So now you, let's say uh, you have your left eye on camera, use this, this uh, image on the left bottom. Uh, you have your left eye at camera two and your right eye at camera three. Then you move to 
right direction. Then you have now your left eye at camera three and your right eye at camera four. So now you have some level of uh, motion parallax. So if you walk to the right, you have a different perspective. This is good. So you have better immersion. Uh, you still have your binocular parallax and you have the motion parallax. Uh, it's limited because once again, usually you have um, just those fixed points of use. Uh, typically they are just for horizontal displacement. Uh, it doesn't mean that you cannot have vertical ones, but usually given the display technology we had and, and the processing capabilities we had, usually horizontal displacement. And uh, the view switching was not smooth because uh, you are really moving discrete steps from camera two to camera three and so on. So yeah, we are improving, we are becoming more immersive, but it's still not quite there. Uh, the next generation, I would say, uh, it's about 3D videos. So I, uh, it's, it's the name that I've been using for other technology, but this one people use to refer to 3D videos uh, that's actually uh, related to multi-view plus depth technology. So you have texture, like you see in the left picture. Uh, I hope the transmission is not mirrored. And the, at the right, you see the depth map. So those sort of technologies start to make sense um, when we have uh, cameras able to capture the depth of the scene and or we have a large array of cameras where we can somehow at, and with good quality infer the depth of the specific scene. What's, what's the gain here? We keep the binocular uh, parallax, we have motion parallax, but now uh, it's a little bit less limit. I'll, I'll discuss a little bit on that. And this happens because we have texture and depth. And with that, we can use rendering techniques to create point between the cameras we had. Remember, we are moving camera two to camera three and camera four. Now you can move to camera 2.35. You can interpolate that, generate that uh, synthetic view in between the cameras, and you have more fluid sort of motion parallax. So this is a real improvement. And uh, there's uh, additional gain, because if uh, when we are using multi-view videos, let's say this, this example from, this is uh, quite, quite old material, uh, we had nine cameras, fixed cameras in the multi-view technology. When we move to 3D, to multi-view plus depth, we can reduce the number of views to be transmitted. So in this example, we just use the leftmost, the rightmost, and the center views, plus their depth maps. Uh, and with this information, we can, with good quality, or reasonably uh, good quality, interpolate and generate those intermediate views that we had. So it's also an opportunity to reduce the amount of data to be transmitted or encoded and stored, uh, and to have more flexibility in terms of uh, view switching. So it, it became more fluid. Uh, usually, for most of the content that we had in this, this technology, let's say, also the horizontal movements were more, more common, not limited to it. But there's another dimension I have discussed uh, about uh, immersion, that's the freedom of movements. And here you don't have much, right? You have the motion parallax, but you don't have what you may call as 3D uh, of freedom, uh, three, three degrees of freedom. So uh, this is a different sort of branch in this media evolution. That's about 360 degrees videos or omnidirectional videos that uh, basically are captured by cameras like the one in the left corner, uh, where you capture uh, from a given point of view, but to different directions. And uh, it allows when you display to uh, observer uh, to move your head in three degrees of freedom, as you see in this plot. So uh, usually they are, uh, we, you need special glasses for that because it's, uh, it makes sense for head mounted sort of uh, solutions. And, uh, but you have this freedom. 
you don't have the motion parallax uh, as you would expect. Like you cannot walk around and see different point of views. You are always at the center of your camera, but you can look up, look down and look right or left. Those sort of technology are uh, usually are based on uh, remapping the all cameras to a given uh, space. Uh, here you see uh, something that looks like when we, we have a planar representation of our, our globe. Uh, but there are many other forms to uh, represent that or, or to, 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 to represent these as a typically image or videos to be processed. So uh, when we bring together the 3D plus dev, the 3D videos, multi-view plus dev, plus what we had in 360 videos, uh, we may ask, OK, so we, we have everything. We have monocular cues that we always had. We have binocular cues, including motion parallax. And we have 3D, uh, three degrees of freedom. Yeah, that's true. Uh, but we, as I mentioned, we don't have the right to move around so we cannot walk around and see different perspectives of the scene so the 6d of the six degrees of freedom uh, are is still not there uh, i'll discuss this a little bit later uh, but what my main concern here is um, about the other aspects so do we have everything else uh, then i have two questions to you the first one is why people get sick using 3d glasses and uh, why AR, augmented and mixed reality, realities uh, do not feel so real uh, when we use those glasses? And I try to start answer, answering this question uh, by bringing uh, additional binocular cues that we have not discussed. The first one is the virgins. That's actually uh, the muscular uh, rotation of our eyeballs. So if you have far away objects, your eyes are more like parallel to each other. You have closer objects, they have higher angle, they are bringing together the, the, their uh, position, right? And uh, the second one is about accommodation. That's the variation of the lens of your eyes. Uh, it's reshaped by this, uh, the accommodation is about the, the reshaping of your, of your lens and it changes focus. Right, and when you are out there in the real world, uh, this is basically one one movement. You change the virgins and you change the accommodation as one movement. It's it, they are they are always together. But when you are using those uh, technology I have described it to you, uh, this is not what happens. Uh, then it brings uh, what it's VAC or vergence and accommodation conflict. It means that uh, when you have objects that are projected before or after the display screen, your uh, eyes are going, are doing the job in terms of vergence to follow that object. But the accommodation itself cannot do it because the focus must be on the display screen. And this is not natural. So this, um, you can deal with that, but maybe you start getting sick after a couple of hours, you are watching a movie or any sort of entertainment related to it. So the question is, okay, we have this problem. How do we solve that? First, we need better displays, of course. Uh, there are, nowadays, uh, you find the, some so-called photonic, uh, displays that can handle this sort of a application and have different planes of projection somehow. But my talk is not about the displays. And my, my talk is more about the data side and the processing side. So it's not just about the displays. It's also about how we capture the data, how we represent the data, because uh, it's not enough having the glasses. Uh, we need to be able, for instance, and the a key feature here is uh, we need to be able to refocus the images. Because if you have new focal planes, you need to dynamically, according to the movement of the 
observer eyes, you need to refocus the image you are displaying. And this is really important. This is actually uh, a key enabler for uh, real immersion. So, and of course, you need also some side features that are actually really important that are like relightening. Uh, you want to bring an object to a new scene. Uh, the lightning, the, the light conditions must be consistent. Otherwise, it's not immersion. Uh, you need to rescale. Uh, you may have captured one object in a much larger scale and bring to a scene. It, it must make sense. So you need data to um, allow you to do all those steps. So we need more information about the scene at the end of the day. And how we get there? Uh, now this is the new concept uh, that's actually not new at all, but uh, the technology itself, uh, it's, it's uh, emerging or being used at the perspective of uh, imaging technology uh, in the last few years, right? So the first concept here is an important concept of the planotic function. And it's understanding, basically understanding that objects communicate communicate to the observers by light rays. We know that. And the Planck function, function is actually a way to describe those light rays. But it's, it's not a small function. It's actually really big in the sense of um, all light information in the universe. And for any given time instant can be described by this 7D function. So uh, if you look in the first three parameters, uh, it's space. So you can describe light rays at any given point in space, at any given point in time, any time instant, F coming from any direction, any angle of incident, and for any wavelength. So it's quite huge. So it's a concept. We are definitely not working uh, with those seven diplomatic functions, but we can use that to learn a little bit and uh, bring or propose more uh, or richer data representation, richer uh, visual signal representation. And the first way, uh, the first model representation model I, I want to bring you is it's light fields. Uh, we are going to talk a little bit also about uh, point clouds, but first light fields. So it's basically a, a simplification of the 7D planoptic function uh, with four dimensions. Okay, so here uh, I'm not discussing about time. So this is just for still light field. Where you have two, and you see, let's just first take a look. You have a photo, if you take it uh, far away, but when you zoom it, you see that instead of pixels, you have like more interesting structures here. We are going to understand a little bit more about it, but it's uh, it you can understand as a position where you're capturing the light, but each different position uh, describes the light coming from a different direction. So instead of one, one sensor at your, your sensor array, it's not just capturing the, the amount of light that are reaching that point, but it also describes the direction the light's coming. We are going to see how it works. And, uh, but in this example here, you see the main feature that I have, in, uh, have been telling you, that's uh, the ability to refocus. You have also some sort of motion, uh, in this case, for these sort of light fields, really small sort of freedom, but you can uh, change the focus of your image. You can have any sort of all-in-focus image. You can work with that. Uh, the data is there. And the light field is basically like an image where you have, uh, here we are, we are using you for the space, uh, coordinates, so like a picture. And when you look into a pixel, it has also these two dimensions, T and S here, that are angular coordinates or angular dimensions. So from that, you learn that we have this 4D structure uh, already uh, in the light fields. Just other examples, light fields, zooming in, you see something Awkward is there, there's some round structure, then you zoom a little bit more and you see 
one of those, when it started, we are, oh, this is a pixel. It's now we can call it a micro image because each one of those positions refer to the light that's being uh, measured or received at a given point from uh, one given uh, direction. So let's take for from instance the middle one. It means the straight means the straight light that's coming directly. If you go to the corners, lights that are uh, coming from higher angles. Uh, to that same location. And you can break, this is uh, another way to break that specific uh, structure, uh, breaking it in multiple images. Uh, those images we call it SAI, so Subaperture aperture images. And actually uh, you may have at the, right, the left, you have uh, the resolution, uh, of this image, in this case, six to five by four to four micro image, where each micro image has a 15 by 15 pixel array. And this is the other way around. You have 15 by 15 SAIs all around, and each one you have an image that's six to five by four to four. So this is the same data represented or displayed in a different way. We call the right super multi view. And then you see that suddenly it's not so different from what we had uh, in earlier days from multi view, right? There are critical important uh, difference here that are really important. I will discuss a little bit more on that. How we can capture those? Well, um, we have one of these at the left corner, uh, but basically, the technology is based on, you have the scene you are want to capture, the camera has a main lens and has an array, a 2D array of micro lenses. And after the light passed through the main lens and from each one of those micro lenses, here after each one of those micro lenses, you have this sensor array that is responsible for capturing the micro image. This is what we have seen in the previous example. This is what is called Planotic 1.0 or unfocused. So each one of those, uh, after, uh, behind of each one of those micro lenses, you see what it's like a more special sort of pixel. Let's put it like this. When you look to the right, you see what is called Planotic 2.0. Uh, and you see that the focus is not anymore on the micro lens, but it's actually on the sensor plane. So it means that when you capture uh, that region of sensors uh, that we call the micro image, uh, what you see is small versions of the entire scene, right? Because it's focused on the sensor plane. And the way uh, we always can convert between them, uh, there might be some information loss in some scenarios, but they are two technologies that may be used for capturing light fields. Uh, the first one uh, you could buy when you buy uh, lighter cameras that actually you cannot buy it anymore, the, the company is not there. And uh, Raytrix, it's uh, famous for producing some of these, what's called Planotic 2.0 sort of light fields, but they are more uh, on niche instead of consumer electronics uh, market. And you can also capture uh, using a high density array of cameras. So you can see now that uh, it's, it's, again, not that different from the previous multi-view sort of solution. And uh, we, we used to call different, uh, and we may refer to this sort of light field that sparse light fields, and the previous one uh, as lenslet light fields or dense light fields. The terminology varies and changes according to different people. But this is not the only possible representation for uh, the planotic function. We may have also point, point cloud representation. Uh, we can say that um, light fields are the pixel base representation and the point clouds are the geometry base representation of uh, this part of the planotic function, right? And yes, we can convert between them. 
again, loss of information may happen. It may be not that easy, but we can represent object or scene in both ways. And we can uh, use both ways to generate interactive scenes. I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit more about that. But when we are thinking about point clouds, we may first think of uh, static point clouds. So usually for, for documenting historical objects and so on, you just capture uh, the point cloud and it's done. It's not moving along the time. We may have dynamic point clouds. And here you see a quite complex scene uh, described as uh, point clouds. And of course, uh, you see some rendering happening after that, because yes, we need to render the point clouds after, uh, after all. And we, it may be also progressive, very useful for sort of autonomous driving cars uh, or, or any other autonomous driving vehicles. Uh, that's a sort of point cloud that grows along the time, but uh, in the sense that new information is, is or information from new locations are, are brought to that specific point cloud. And these, as I mentioned, they are representation, planotic representations uh, that can be uh, changed across representations, point clouds, light fields, and so on. Uh, they can be combined to be in the more complex scenes. Uh, they have information to bring you depth perception, of course, if you have point clouds, you are you are going to render specific point of views so the observer can have this perception. Uh, but you have information for binocular and stereo parallax. You have motion parallax, of course. You have uh, information uh, to render points of views using depth image-based rendering. And if you are using dense light fields. You can even use a simpler and faster, lighter, lightweight sort of rendering that's called image-based rendering. And this is really important for um, head-mounted uh, displays uh, where you need to have really smooth transition between planes You need to oh, and, and, and view points. So if you're in that scenario uh, and you you can do it faster, it's, it's really good. The, the, the experience of the observer is much better. The switching will be much more fluid, which is good. And of course, the data allows you to do the refocusing that I, I discussed with you before, relighting your scaling and so on. And because of that, we can solve VAC or vergence and accommodation conflict. It's, of course, it's not that easy. It must be done really fast uh, and smoothly, but we have the data to do that. And since we have richer information now, we have the three degrees of freedom, but we may also have the six degree of freedom. Of course, it depends on uh, which style of point cloud or light field we are using, but we have the data uh, if you want to do that. So now you can move your head around, looking up, looking down, right and left, but you can also walk around the scene. You can change completely the perspective you are looking to the scene. And this is really important if you really want immersion. Okay, so now the challenge. What, what are actually the challenges uh, that we see these days? Basically in every single point of the capturing to displaying pipeline. So capturing is challenging. Data representation and, and define the format for this data is challenging. Compression, of course, is very challenging and I will talk more about this aspect, transmission, and of course, displaying. So there are challenges simply everywhere in this sort of technology. And this is, this is good news. We have research to, to do along the next decades. So from the compression perspective, I just want to show you these, these numbers. Uh, I, I brought just modest numbers, not really exaggerating. But if you take full HD videos, 30 frames per second, you see nothing really fancy. Uh, we are talking about 93 megabytes per second of raw data. Okay, this is quite a lot. We can compress uh, it 100 more times or over maybe 1,000 times. And, but when, when we keep moving to 3D, 
this example, the very same example, but now with three views, uh, multi-view plus def and three views. So we are talking about 466 megabytes per second. So we are increasing. If we look at the point cloud with 1 million points, uh, dynamic point cloud, uh, we are talking about 210 megabytes per second. Now you say, okay, so it's, it's easier to uh, deal with point clouds than 3D videos because they, they, they are like nearly half of the amount of data. Actually, it's not like that because uh, this example, 1 million points point cloud, it's for one object. So if you want really to design the whole scene or we have multiple objects and or you have a, a richer background, so keep adding up, keep adding up, right? And one example of motion light field, 15 by 15 views, uh, also full HD, we are talking about 20 gigabytes per second. So this is really a lot, right? So, um, this is not the sort of amount of data we want to process, trans no, sorry, we need to process, but we don't want to transmit or store. So there are many challenges and to compress this data because it's mandatory. It's, it's, there's no way possible to process that and transmit and store that if, if, uh, without efficient compression. So what do we have for compression these days? Uh, the first effort I would say is uh, related to JPEG Plano. Uh, Plano stands for Plano Optics. Um, that's looking for static sort of uh, light fields and, and point clouds. Uh, and MPEG I, uh, that's actually an effort from MPEG that uh, considers uh, both. Uh, sort of, uh, light field sort of uh, content and point cloud sort of content. I will talk a little bit more about that, the, where MPEG I, the I means immersive. And uh, those uh, technologies are, are together in what they call these days V3C, that's visual volumetric video based coding, right? And also we have geometry based coding point, point sorry, point cloud compression. That's uh, not really an MPEG I, but it's also an MPEG sort of effort. And I will try to bring a rough idea what this uh, solution have to us. So, and what are the challenges? Firstly, JPEG Plano, uh, it's uh, thought to uh, handle light field data, point cloud data and uh, holograms. Nowadays, only the light field part is developed, the point clouds is under development, and the holograms I'm not discussing uh, today. And, but the light fields part, that's uh, the part two actually, uh, it's able to uh, work in two modes, what's called the prediction mode and the 4D transform mode. When you look at the prediction mode, you are going to see that uh, there new tools, but it's also based on previous technology. And this is one point that I'll highlight in many points uh, during the presentation. Uh, if you see, you take, in this example, you take the center of your light field, that's uh, here, understand as a multi-view sort of uh, displaying, and you take the center one, and you encode it using one image codec, like JPEG 2000, all the experiments, have been done with the JPEG 2000, could be anyone, uh, any other sort of uh, codec. Then the new part actually is how you generate. You generate inverse depth maps and you use that to warp and, and add up and bring uh, efficient predictions uh, in a hierarchical way. So use that first layer to predict the second layer and the second for the third and so on. And once you bring this prediction, you use the, again, uh, standard codec like JPEG 2000 to encode the residues. The, what, what's wrong with your prediction and also the inverse depth maps. So that's how you do. It's uh, strongly based on previous technology. That's known technology. The 4D transform mode is actually quite different. Uh, the basic building blocks are somehow, if you read the names, they are somehow known, but uh, the concept is really different from my understanding. Instead of working uh, over images, you really work over the 4D uh, structure of the light fields. 
So we, you, you break the light field in 4D hypercubes or 4D blocks and you apply a, a transformation, DCT, over those blocks. Uh, and here, uh, a wide variety of sizes, actually any size you can use, uh, they are not using integer approximation, so it's also challenging. And then you take that specific 4D structure that is hard to represent, and you start breaking it in uh, exadeca trees. That's exadeca tree decomposition, and then arithmetic coding, that's entropy coding, uh, similar to what we have seen in, in other uh, video codecs. So this uh, I understand as uh, a new concept when uh, you bring to coding of light fields. And well, at the end of the day, uh, they have these two modes because uh, the prediction mode is presents best performance when for sparse light fields and the 4D transform mode uh, has best best performance for denser light fields. Of course, you are you have 4D blocks. You are making the transformation to a frequency domain, and if they are really dense, you have the, the, uh, the a good advantage in this scenario. If they are sparse, then you cannot really exploit uh, the characteristic of the data. When we look to the MPEG guy. Uh, what we see again is that the, you, you have support to light fields uh, that are called multi-camera, that are the sparse ones, dense light fields that are uh, the lens light ones, and uh, what's called VPCC, that's the video-based point cloud compression. And you are going to see, I, I brought this uh, diagram here because everything you see here is like input views, depth maps, camera parameters, then you see this TMIV encoder, that's the test model for immersive video. Then you see attribute atlases and geometry atlases plus some metadata. And here you see video encoder. It means that basically what MPEG I is defining is a sort of uh, translation and data preparation for regular video encoders. So all the experiments in PEGI have been done using HEVC or VVC or some of the extensions for HEVC, like for screen content and so on. And what actually is encoded are the so-called atlases and patches that are this sort of information. So let's see, This is uh, these are three views multi cameras or light fields, and they are vertically displaced, you may see that um, they see different information in the scene. Let's see the, 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 the watch here, it's, it's fully seen here, partially here, and not seen at all down here. So what you are building, take the center, the central view, and you also uh, find the new information you have in other views. And with all information, you build a frame. And you see, this is really a patchwork in here. You are bringing all this information and fitting together in one frame. Here, it's the same sort of uh, exercise for uh, the point cloud. So you see that specific point cloud, you project in one given direction, and then you create this sort of map that's a map of presence there. This is the depth map, so how far the object is from the, the camera or the observer, and this is the textures, texture map, so the actual texture. You do it not for just one projection, but for multiple ones, and you take that information and you assemble or do, again, patchworking, so you create this map to say, oh, this, this is valid information, this is not. You create a patchwork of depth maps and one for the texture. And now, this is video. This is, these are images, but along the time, it's basically video. You see there, there's some blur here because this is just to avoid those really uh, strong transitions that you'd have in these scenarios that would actually make your coding uh, work very hard. So you do some blurring here. There are some more interesting techniques. It's not a simple blur, but you are somehow blurring it so to facilitate the coding. But basically, you have images now. And uh, along the time, of course, you have video. 
when you encode uh, as graphic, uh, as, as a geometry, then we are using actually the volume and uh, decomposing those data in octrees. So that's how it's done. I'm much into details. But where, where can we contribute to that? So I, I, I'm going to try to show three perspectives uh, on how to contribute to the field, right? The first one is about coding algorithms, development, and optimization. Right. So, of course, I'm bringing some example that uh, from what we have done and what we are doing. But basically, we need solutions for uh, understanding 360 videos, even though they might be uh, more than videos. They might be uh, richer information. But we need to find solutions that uh, can understand the data and exploit that to bring more efficient coding and faster coding because we are going to 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 do it uh, this processing sometimes in real time if you have glasses and uh, or you are capturing some some object in one scene and inserting another scene you need to do it really fast so in this solution here we just observe how uh, this translation between the sphere and the plane are done. And we just observe that there are specific behaviors that uh, happens at the polar regions. And we use that to reduce the complexity and uh, while avoiding important sort of uh, compression losses. So this is the sort of thing we need. Uh, when you look to uh, point cloud, uh, you still need a lot of uh, effort in a way to predict point clouds a long time. So one of these uh, contributions from, from my group is uh, really to find the efficient prediction uh, across neighboring uh, point clouds along the time. So if you have one, one point cloud and it's instant zero and instant one, it's very likely the point cloud is very similar. So how can you exploit that? And uh, there are some pretty good numbers in, in this sense. Uh, and a lot of uh, new techniques are still very welcome in this sense. We have also proposed, uh, when looked to light fields, uh, new variations on how to do prediction. So if we look at the problem as a multi-view sort uh, of data, uh, it's really... Um, it really makes sense to understand that the displacement keeps uh, one rule. So if we compare the central view with the rightmost one, you probably have information to render and create the views that are in between, right? So we use this sort of uh, knowledge and use uh, optical flow and phase correlation uh, in order to do uh, an alternative sort of prediction of those views. And we use that uh, along with the HVC, that's uh, state of the art or actually the market standard for video coding. And we, we saw that we were able to improve the quality for low bit rates, which, which is really good. We are uh, at this moment uh, only considering lens led sort of light fields, but we want to extend to high density cameras and see if uh, this sort of uh, approach makes sense. Also looking to algorithms for light field compression. Um, if you remember about uh, JPEG Plano, you don't do prediction at all. You go directly to 4D transform and uh, exadeca decomposition and entropy. So one of our concepts here is really why not trying to do some level of prediction and in using the philosophy of the 4D transform mode, that's understanding the data as a 4D data, as it is. So uh, we are working on this uh, prediction step uh, in variations of explicit quantization, because uh, the quantization that happens in JPLAG Plano is it's a little bit different. And considering different sort of transforms, like instead of only uh, cosine transforms, also sine transforms and a composition of those. Especially for the prediction, basically what we want to do is answer what should be in that uh, blank block. So uh, we take the neighbor, the neighbor regions of the light field and use this as information trying to 
predict that specific block. And here we are using or working on strategies that are rule-based, so using some sort of interpolation and trying to understand the scene and generate some prediction, and also learning-based approach because it really makes sense in this sort of application. We have seen working in the 3D domain for images, so we, we are working now in the 4D domain to bring efficient prediction for light fields. Also, of course, this uh, might be of higher interest of this community. It's uh, about dedicated hardware design. Uh, it's, I'll tell a little bit later, but it's not about everything should be dedicated, but something must be because we have really intense processing kernels. And here is one of the architectures we have developed for uh, 3D, 3D or multi-view plus depth. Right, and in this concept here, we uh, first we have a dedicated machine for the base view and other for the dependent views. Here we work with three views encoding at real time. In this, uh, the base view, we first work on the texture, so actual image, and after that we work on depth maps because this is a restriction of the three D codec we we were using. After that, we change ways. So we work first over depth maps and followed by texture map. This is the motion and part estimation step. So we need to search for similarities in previews or, or, or views that are at the right or the left. And here we learn that for the dependent views, we can first do for the depth maps and use this information to speed up the texture search because the texture has much more details. So uh, as far as we have some indication from the depth map that is an easier search, we just refine for the texture. And this is the sort of machine that we have been developing along uh, the years uh, for the processing path but also consider the memory structure because bringing data uh, from external memory is actually one of the largest challenges when we are processing this amount of data. So uh, we, we, in this example here, we dynamically adapt the size of the window we are searching for. So, and when we detect based on the depth information that our search will be more, centered in a smaller region, we can turn off memory sectors. And in this way, you can reduce the processing effort, of course, but also the memory consumption in terms of uh, static uh, consumption, right? Uh, with the solution, uh, we were able to reach uh, Full HD at real time for three, uh, three views, which is pretty, pretty interesting for uh, three years ago already, and uh, we were able to reach a power reduction of nearly 8% when compared to classic solutions, right? We have solutions where we are evaluating uh, non-volatile memories. In this case, we are building our banks using SRAN for some specific sort of data and STT RAN for other sort of data, always observing the data behavior, right? In this case, we had really strong reductions also in terms of energy for the on-chip memory. Also looking, now this is really toward light fields uh, because uh, this is the first solution we, we know for the 4D transform in the, the JPEG plan. And the challenge here is that the, the standard defines double flowing point precision and the round, rounding just after all the dimensions are applied. We have performed some studies to find how can we represent it uh, in fixed point sort of representation, avoiding losses. We define some, um, some the representation, some bit pruning techniques, and at the end of the day, we end up with this uh, architecture that's basically built of two 2D DCT. And this is critical because 2D DCTs we have been doing for decades for image and video processing. And of course, one for, for the transposition memory, that's actually our big challenge. So if you see in the machines that are the 2D DCTs, you see that's basically the same uh, sort of solution we have been using for video. but of course, we have challenge when we need to transpose a 4D structure. 
And we have proposed this, uh, this structure that's composed of multiple planes, cubes, and memory banks, uh, and multiple writing and reading ports to handle that. Uh, we are able to deliver a, a throughput for 30 light fields per second, considering lighter sort of light fields. And, but we are restricted at this point to eight-sided hypercubes, eight by eight by eight by eight. So it, it's not done. It's just this, the beginning, because if you, the JPEG planner requests larger blocks. <laughs> uh, here below, you can see how this 4D structure grows as we grow the, the, the side of the hypercube. And it grows really fast because it's power of four. So this is uh, really challenging, right? So we are working to improve that. Finally, some, some points we have been working and that are really important. It's uh, the architecture level. I'm, I'm going fast for this one. Uh, some solutions that are based on NOC structures, uh, NOC, so uh, we can have the flexibility and adapt at real time. So sometimes we are processing more data or less data. We can turn on and turn off regions of that specific network. Uh, we are using, we are looking for heterogeneous system because we know that we are going to need to process uh, on embedded devices, cloud uh, infrastructures, and sometimes we won't have dedicated hardware for that. So uh, we need to make it a little bit more flexible. And for that, we have been working on system level simulators uh, that allow us to do efficient design space exploration uh, at really high level and including FPGAs with partial reconfiguration and so on. Right. So after going through this, uh, these discussions, I would like to end up with my two cents on, on this, this topic that's uh, trying to wrap up what we have discussed and the, bring the message that I want you to take home. That's basically that the future is heterogeneous and diverse. It means that uh, we are having multiple capturing devices, light fields, uh, planet cameras, a half cameras, lidars, depth cameras, and so on. Visual data representation like images, videos, multi-view, 3D, uh, multi-view plus depth, 360, light fields, point clouds, they will be there. Codecs, even worse. We have discussed JPEG Plano and MPEG-I. But uh, you have seen that some of them use basic encoders or 2D or 3D encoders inside of those solutions. And now we are talking about maybe H.264 and the extensions HEVC and the extensions VVC, EVC, VP9, AV1, and AV2 that are belong to Alliance for Open Media, the Chinese codex AVS 1, 2, and 3. So they are, they are, they are going to be there for quite a long. And different processing platform with different processing resources, mobile devices, something maybe we need to process on the edge or on the cloud and so on. And finally, different display devices with heterogeneous clients. You may have had mounted displays, eye tracking, head tracking, volumetric, holograms, simple 2D and 3D displays, and so on. So it means that there will be no technology to rule them all. The ring is uh, a request from my colleague, Marcelo Porto. So it means that we need to support multiple technologies, uh, multiple, uh, in multiple devices and uh, processing infrastructures. Uh, it means that we are going to also to reuse multiple concepts along different technologies. And this is important. And at the end of the day, what we need is all about flexible solutions. We need to support new codecs. So you, you don't want to have one codec printed in your integrated circuit. And as soon as new technology comes, you cannot handle it. So you need flexible solutions. Hierarchical approaches so we can uh, really deliver smooth sort of experience. Smart exploration of heterogeneity of the processing elements, algorithm optimization, highly efficient, dedicated solutions. So see, I, I just told that we need flexibility. And here I see, OK, we need dedicated solution. That's true, because we need to be able to find 
intense processing kernels that are common across different technologies, let's say, transforms. They are there for diff almost all of those uh, codecs that I mentioned, and we need to have dedicated solutions and really efficient solution for those, right? Uh, and of course, we have intelligent uh, memory communication and control uh, using approximate storage and volatile memories, processing memory, because the amount of data flow is really, really intense for these sort of technologies to come, right? So just to end up, uh, what you need is uh, the contribution you may bring to the field. Uh, I believe it is just a really hot topic for decades to come. And there are many challenges from capturing to displaying. And there are opportunities for a wide variety of people for coming from multiple disciplines like physicists, mathematicians, engineers, computer scientists, and so on. So that's the message. There's a lot of research to be done. And please feel free to reach me if you are interested in the field, if I, I was able to motivate you uh, about the importance of, of this sort of technology and the research on these topics. So thank you, Claudio. Uh, please, I, I, I'm afraid I speak a little bit too much, but I hope to, to be able to bring the message. Okay, thank you, Bruno. Yeah, right on time. So, um, because we started on uh, one hour ago exactly. So, um, thank you very much for the great talk. Um, it's also uh, it's ever um, every time is a pleasure to to hear you. Uh, so, uh, we have a question from uh, Anderson Ferrugin from your university, Pelotas. Uh, Hi, Professor Zach. I have interest in light fields. How you, how do you see uh, the growth of the area. This, this is interesting because Ferrugin works with us uh, actually. So yeah, he's, <laughs> he's just wrote the discussion. Uh, yeah, this this is um, there, as you know, Anderson, there are many opportunities and it really comes from capturing. And I know you are working uh, with problems related to data sets, as simple as that. We don't have data set for many experiments that we'd like to do. So there are challenges in this perspective. And uh, other point, as, as probably you want to hear, is about the depth uh, generation. Because depending on the technology you use to capture, you, you already have the depth information. But if you are doing some sort of pixel-based capturing, like light fields, capturing landslide cameras, array, array of cameras, generating the depth map is critical. Otherwise, you cannot render the, the, the new point of views. So all those uh, interesting ideas about fluid motion or motion parallax and, and uh, vergence and accommodation together uh, seamlessly uh, going to work if we don't have good depth maps to make proper rendering. And and all other points that are brought. So these this just point some, some aspects that I know that you are interested in. Okay, we have another uh, question now uh, from Lucas Freitas. I, I didn't get his institution here. Uh, hello, Professor Zati. I have a question. We are facing the AI revolution in industry and in, in the academia as well. Uh, how the video coding area are dealing with the deep learning revolution? How are you adapting to this trend? Thank you for the excellent talk. He Thank also you. mentioned that uh, uh, NVIDIA published a paper leveraging deep learning algorithms search as var variational autoencoders and gains to tackle the video streaming problem. It's Lucas, right? Yeah, Lucas Freitas. So Lucas, thank you for the question. Yeah, this this is uh, something that's definitely happening uh, in this community and in all different tools uh, that we have been uh, used in the last decades. They are people are rethinking uh, in order to bring uh, AI based solutions or uh, what's usually referred to learning based sort of solutions. In this talk, uh, it was not my goal. Uh, you have seen that I, I, I never opened one tool of the codex or the, 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 the 
the algorithms I, I did not discuss my my idea was like bring it more global but uh, let's take the example of the transforms there are people working on learn based transforms instead of using DCT or DST. Uh, prediction, as I mentioned, one of our solution is really uh, towards uh, learning-based sort of prediction. So yeah, it's there. Uh, you are going to uh, see that MPEG has a, spe a special group working on AI solutions. JPEG also has people working on AI solution. Recently, it has been created the MPAI that's the um, a group that's also working on uh, technology for uh, video image uh, compression, that's the name itself has uh, AI on the name. So it's it's definitely happening. Uh, nowadays, you can see many works in this direction. Uh, any conference we are going to see uh, special tracks for that. So yeah, this, this community is not stopped in this, in this aspect. Okay, thanks. Uh, there's also a question uh, from Gustavo Avelar. Uh, I'd like to ask Professor Bruno, what is his opinion about the tools, platforms, or technologies we can currently use to create immersive VR applications for wide usage in Brazil, considering more the applications with educational goals? Gustavo, this is a nice question. Uh, Firstly, I, I, I'm not the best person to answer that. I'm, I'm not really in this uh, content creation. So my answer is it's not precise in this aspect. Um, I know that uh, those main uh, infrastructures, uh, let's say displays that are able to deliver immersive experience, they have their own uh, tool sets and their own um, development uh, channels and tools to do that uh, but it, if it's uh, reasonable to consider for brazil let's say uh, magic leap i know that you can go online and register and start to, to being a developer for content uh, in, in partnership with them but I, I i cannot tell you precisely what will be the cost if it's reasonable to consider developing for this technology to bring to brazil or the costs are prohibitive so yeah my my answer won't be precise in this aspect sorry gustav okay um yeah we have now uh 38 people watching uh, there are some people from outside brazil also so please identify yourself in the in the, in the chat, please. Um, I have a question from myself. So uh, Bruno, um, what's the main difference between the light field and point cloud uh, in the sense of what applications will benefit from each other, from each one? This this is a question that I will take very long to. <laughs> Okay, so to, sorry. <laughs> to, to, to really uh, give a good answer, right? But I, what I see, um, when, when I look to uh, augmented and mixed reality sort of applications, what I see is that uh, the sort of light field um, sort of data would make more sense for the scene itself, for the background and for, for, for what's there. Uh, in, in the beginning when we are capturing. And light uh, and point clouds, it's really interesting when to insert something new on that specific scene. Uh, so uh, let's say we have one, we are at my room and we are capturing you at your room and I want you to have a, I want to have experience. You are sitting by my side here. So uh, for bringing this object that's actually you in this example it would really make more sense uh, in my first impression if we want to have full immersion to have bring you as a point cloud sort of uh, representation uh, of course if i just want to uh, we are stop in one in front of the other we don't need the this this sort of information maybe the light field from one direction is fine enough. I have some level of motion parallax. Uh, I'm not going surround you in any way. So it, it really depends on the application. Uh, that's why my, my, my understanding of the problem is that these, all these sort of technologies are going to be there. Uh, 
they are going to work together to build more complex sort of environments or virtual or, or mixed augmented environments. And But there's one point where light fields are critically important that's uh, for very dense light fields. Uh, when you have the, the head mounted displays and you need to do that eye, that plane switching and focus switching really quickly so people can move the eyes and see, really see as we see in the uh, real world. Uh, for that, uh, even if the original data is uh, a point cloud, let's say, it, you want to convert it to a very dense light field because then it's um, easier, it's not the best word, but it's, it's, it's simpler to, to adapt the, the, the pixels, because at the end of the day, you are projecting pixels, right? So you want to project the pixels in the right plane, refocusing and doing it uh, in a fast or fluid way. So in this specific case, I see that you, anyhow, you are going to need to, to convert to a very dense light field. OK, thank you. Uh, there's a question from Professor Altamir Suzin from the Federal University of Rio Grande do Sul. Uh, he said, the "Excellent talks, thanks. Where the bottom? Where are the bottlenecks for advanced technologies like Plano, Multiviews, and etc." Thank you, Professor Suzin. Uh, this is uh, just to mention, right? We started. I started working on you as well, Cloud, working yeah, on yeah. this. Uh, <laughs> video processing, sig visual signal processing with Professor Suzin and Professor Bumpy. So uh, thank you, actually. Uh, this is a result of your long time before, Professor. Uh, the bottlenecks, oh, I, I, I thought the talk was all about bottlenecks because the technology is far away from being ready um, in so many perspectives. There, there, there are challenges literally everywhere. So of course, when we present these and oh, this looks nice, but when we really need to solve the problems, it's it's um, it's not that simple. Remember that if I'll, I'll bring to at the the end part. Remember that if you want to have uh, an immersive experience, it must be fluid, real time, seamless, and and this. By itself, it's, it's a problem uh, because you have a lot of data and you may have multiple representation interacting. So there's a lot of computation, there's a lot of data flow to, to happen. And even if we have, let's say, perfect glasses for that, delivering the data to be displayed, is it's, it's a huge challenge. So I'll, I'll, just to pick one, I pick this one. Uh, even if all the, the other steps in the pipeline are solved, this is, is going to be an issue. And yeah, probably you, are, you want to do it like uh, in a mobile sort of environment. So once again, another big problem for circuits and system society. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Bruno. So there are uh, many people like uh, thanking your excellent talk here. We don't have more questions, so I, I think you can acknowledge you again for the excellent talk and uh, I give the floor uh, back to Professor Reis to make the, uh, and, and to you if you want to see some words, uh, say some words. Thank you. Thank you, Claudio. Thank you, Professor Reis. Uh, it was, for me, it was a pleasure. Uh, I hope uh, this talk can be of some use of some of you that are attending. And yeah, again, it's, it, it was a really pleasure from my side. So thank you very much, Bruno Zat, for this excellent talk. Thank you, Claudio, for chairing the session.